Hi, my name is Eric Baca, and I'm a co-founder of Motion Workshop here in Seattle, Washington in the US. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting on the topic of inertial motion capture for human kinematics. All right, the title of this presentation is Inertial Motion Capture for Human Kinematics. And more specifically, I'll be going over how uh, many of our customers and uh, other individuals use our shadow motion capture system to both record data and also to uh, use the tools that we provide to load data for visualization purposes and other tools like MATLAB and Python. So what you'll be seeing today in this presentation, um, first of all, we'll start out with an overview of the shadow motion capture system. We'll move on to uh, recording a mocap take of both normal and abnormal walking gait cycles. Then we're going to load the take in Mocha, which is a free open source tool for looking at C3D data. And uh, we'll plot some data in there and kind of look at some channels to try to get uh, more timing information about the gate cycle. And next, uh, we'll load that take into MATLAB and compare the gate cycles based on the timing information we got from Mocha. Then finally, um, we'll load this take, the same take into uh, Python and uh, do some visualization of the gate cycles uh, using NumPy and Matplotlib. So first, let's talk a little bit about the shadow motion capture system itself. Uh, you'll see uh, this model's wearing it here, and she you can see she's got some um, uh, rendering in the background that's in a Unity game engine. But uh, over, overall, um, I'll be going over the specifics of the shadow motion capture system in the next uh, few slides. But uh, first, let's talk about a few of the use cases. The first one that's probably pretty obvious is animation. Uh, many of our customers, we uh, sell the system to use uh, the shadow mocap system for recording animation clips uh, for use in games, uh, for uh, visual effects, for video games, film, animation for um, commercials, and uh, many other purposes where you might want to take the data recorded to a file format like FBX and uh, then just load it into a 3D content creation application. Uh, the second use case uh, is live streaming. Uh, so a lot of uh, individuals now are using our, our shadow system to live stream a performance um, into, it could be YouTube, it could be pretty much any kind of um, uh, streaming service, or into a game engine. For instance, um, we provide plugins for both Unity and Unreal, as you can see in this video here, where we took several assets from the Unreal Marketplace and applied our shadow plugin to uh, drive their animation directly. Uh, the cool thing about the system using this plugin uh, that we created is that you can uh, apply it to pretty much any asset that uh, uses the same skeletal model as the Unreal Marketplace provides. Uh, so there's a ton of content that you can use for free. Um, again, this is more of a um, live streaming application, but uh, you can see how it can be useful. So the next uh, uh, use case, and this is what we'll be focusing on in this presentation, is uh, human kinematics. And uh, basically using the shadow mocap system for uh, biomechanics research, where you want to take data and compare uh, how different um, body segments are rotating, moving, accelerating, um, and uh, show you how to use some of the tools in this presentation to do so. So I'll just first go over the uh, Shadow MoCap hardware here. Um, you can see on the right, that's kind of the full kit where you've got um, you know, the shirt and 17 inertial sensors. Uh, the, some of them are in the shirt, there's two on the shoulders, on the chest, and then the rest of the sensors uh, are embedded in straps that you wear on the body. Um, we've found that that's more popular with a lot of people who are doing clinical research uh, because it's easier to put on and take off the system. Um, there's fewer sanitary issues with if you know if you have a full body suit, for instance, and also it's a, it is possible to fit individuals a little bit more easily of different uh, body shapes and sizes. Um, next, it also includes pressure sensor insoles that you can wear in the shoe, and uh, these have a pressure sensor underneath the ball and underneath the heel of the shoe, sorry, of the foot, and. 
the, that information um, is available in the data stream, which we'll be looking at later. Uh, next on the belt, there's a Wi-Fi controller. Um, it's a quad-core embedded system that uh, has Wi-Fi, so you can connect and stream data wirelessly. And finally, a USB battery pack uh, that's worn on the belt as well, and that uh, pack lasts about eight hours. So the the hardware, you can see the controller on the right and uh, one of the actual nodes. Um, they're all uh, wired over a bus system. Um, and because of that, we're able to stream data very fast. Uh, it can actually stream and record up to 400 hertz, uh, which is faster than most other systems that are out there on the market. Um, the internal update rate is up to one kilohertz. I, I miswrote that. Um, it's, I believe the default is 800 hertz, but it goes up to 1000 hertz. Uh, for the internal update rate and the sensor fusion algorithm on uh, the sensors. Um, and one of the benefits of uh, inertial mocap hardware in general, including ours, uh, is that the sensors are by nature uh, pr produce very smooth continuous rotation data. Uh, essentially all of these sensors are um, three degree of freedom. Um, they output rotation data and, and not necessarily position. The position is calculated later in a kinematic uh, model, which we'll be talking about in a sec. So next, uh, let's just talk briefly about the software that comes with the shadow system. So we'll kind of be going over this, um, uh, be showing some videos, and then we'll be um, showing how to record a take uh, in a little bit. Uh, the main um, portion of this is the shadow app. It's a desktop app, uh, works in Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Um, and if you don't want to use any of those OSs and do it on you know, like a mobile platform, uh, you can access the shadow controller directly uh, from a web browser that has the same UI. So pretty much any device that has Wi-Fi, um, including smartphones and tablets, uh, you can access and control uh, the shadow system. Uh, from this app or the UI, um, you can do a lot. There's the 3D preview. Um, you can look at chart view of the individual sensor data, um, change any of the settings. Um, in addition, uh, you can also set the rest pose, which is um, one of the first steps you need to do before you start recording data. Uh, talk about the kinematic model uh, for Shadow. Um, you can see on the right, this is an authored skeleton model. And uh, it has, you know, some pretty obvious body segments that it's a very um, pretty standard topology for both animation and maybe slightly less joints uh, that might be used for biomechanics models that some of you have used. But um, there are both sensor-driven body segments um, where the sensor itself drives the body segment directly. And there are also interpolated body segments, uh, which uh, such as like so if you can see like the spine mid and spine low, as well as the neck, uh, those are interpolated joints because they don't have a specific sensor driving them directly. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the inertial sensors output rotational data. It's uh, three degrees of freedom. And so the root position uh, for, for, comes from the skeletal model and contact points with the ground. It's essentially uh, to get any kind of root motion, uh, you can't just use the 3 duf data from the inertial sensors. And so it's essentially, it's a, it's a kinematic simulation uh, based off of contact points with the ground. And uh, that, um, portion of the software is aided by pressure sensor insoles. So we get some kind of qualitative data um, based on what portion of the foot is on the ground. And um, that data is also uh, available for use in the data stream for processing, which, um, like I said, we're going to look at an example of that in a bit. So um, with that, I'm going to show a video here that's uh, recorded previously. It's about showing how to record a basic take um, inside of the shadow software and um, how to set the rest pose. And after that, um, we'll come back and continue. To begin, connect to the shadow Wi-Fi. Now start the shadow app. And we'll go to the devices tab. You can see that we're connected and reading from 17 devices. In the 3D viewer, we're going to set the rest pose. This is the classic T-pose with arms straight out, palms down, feet forward, directly underneath your hips. So we'll set the rest pose. And now we'll just take a seat. 
Next, go to the Settings tab. We need to turn on C3D Auto Export for exporting to the C3D format, which is compatible with the Mocha Biomechanics Viewer. Next, go back to the 3D Viewer, and we're going to record a short take. So, start recording the take. You can see the icon turns blue. Do some arm motion, and stop recording the take. Now on the left you can see it's exported to a C3D file. This will be located along with the, all the rest of the binary take data in the documents folder under motion, take, and then today's date. And here you can see the second take we have in this folder is the C3D file that we're looking for. So next like start up Mocha and we can load that C3D file into this uh, app. Select the C3D file and drag it into the um, Mocha app, and you can see we have it loaded. We'll need to load the shadow skeleton so you can see all the body segments. And then you can just drag the slider and look at the data in the 3D view. You can also plot data, and so we'll just take, for instance, um, take perhaps the right forearm and we can look at the position data in the top three plots. You can also look at uh, other types of data down under the analog channels. This includes all of the data that's available in the um, SDK data stream, including quaternion data format, Euler angles, uh, and all of the data that you could probably want to look at is in this uh, list here. Some other features in the Mocha app is you can select nodes in the 3D view uh, so that if they're hard to find, it's, you can just click on them inside of the 3D view and they'll get selected. Uh, you can also add motion trails. So if you say track selected marker, uh, it will add a motion trail for that specific one. This, in this case, the left hand. So that's it. Uh, Mocha Biomechanics Viewer is a free open source app you can just download and uh, use for viewing shadow motion capture data. All right, so the next uh, thing I'd like to discuss is uh, the hybrid uh, hybrid tracking and what that means. Um, the, normally you can use shadow as a sourceless uh, mocap system, meaning you don't have to have any ex external sensors, which is quite nice because you can take the system with you and use it really anywhere. Uh, the take that I recorded later for um, gate cycles I just took to the park. Um, so that's uh, pretty convenient to be able to do that. Uh, but in, if you want to get probably slightly more accurate position data, um, we provide uh, what we call our hybrid tracking kit. And the, the default kit that we use is uh, based off of the HTC Vive base station and tracker, which you can see over on the right. Uh, this is the base station and the, uh, the tracker that's worn on the body. Um, they, essentially, the root position uh, is, is driven by the body-worn uh, position tracker, uh, which in the default kit is the HTC Vive tracker, uh, but we also support OptiTrack, so you can use an optical rigid body marker set, um, as you can see, like uh, these little guys over here. And uh, the main benefit of using the hybrid tracking uh, kit with Shadow is that you get drift-free position data. Um, which is pretty great uh, if you want to get a, kind of a close to ground truth um, uh, data stream for the position. Um, yeah, so the, each tracker also provides a full position and rotational data stream, which is uh, six degrees of freedom, um, which is great because you can even add more trackers if you want to, to um, place them on objects in the scene or um, body segments that aren't being tracked or whatever you want to. And all that tracking data comes through in the shadow data stream, the same frame of reference as the uh, all the other shadow data. So it's quite easy to use if you want to process it in uh, MATLAB or Python or another type of uh, processing system and software. Uh, last thing I'll note is that for the Vive, the tracking volume is up to 10 by 10 meters if you use four base stations. And uh, with OptiTrack, you can add more cameras and, and make pretty much any kind of tracking volume you want. 
Okay, so here you'll see a video that we recorded um, with HTC. Uh, we did a demonstration with a dancer from Cornish College of the Arts where uh, we, she was wearing the shadow mocap system and uh, using the hybrid tracking kit. So we actually augmented it with three trackers. She has uh, one on each foot as well as one on the hips. And uh, you can see, well, you can't, you can't see all the base stations, but this had four base stations set up for a 10 by 10 meter tracking volume. And uh, as you can see, it's, it's possible to live stream and use that data to apply to a real-time character and composite also in real-time over the uh, video background. So here is another video of a different application in which we used an OptiTrack system. With, I believe we had uh, nine or ten cameras. Um, and it was a, you know, a fairly small tracking volume, but the, the goal of this project was uh, to show how to um, record the mocap animation of the, the assembly process, and in this case of an IKEA coffee table. Uh, so we marked up the table with uh, optical markers such that each piece was a rigid body, and then tracked those, including the tool, which is just a standard uh, driver tool, um, which then we used a, um, a custom software algorithm to uh, generate an operating procedure showing how to assemble that table and made a, a little virtual reality um, app so you can kind of do it in VR afterwards. So as you can see, there, there are a lot of different um, methods of using this uh, hybrid tracking system that could really create some new use cases for, I believe, a lot of different applications in human kinematics research. So uh, let's talk about export data formats. Um, you can see in the app on the right, uh, this is the settings tab, and um, there's a little drop-down box uh, that you can see. It's got BVH, C3D, uh, CSV, and FBX. So the main ones that I, most people would use, I, I don't think BVH is used by really anyone anymore. Um, some other mocap providers still support it. We support it, but um, we would recommend switching to FBX. That's a more standard format that's uh, usable on any content creation app. But for uh, human kinematics uh, research, uh, it's probably more appropriate to choose C3D and CSV formats. CSV is just a you know a spreadsheet, so you can open it up in Excel or a different spreadsheet editor. Um, C3D is um, the coordinate 3D format, and uh, it's supported by a few different uh, softwares, including uh, biomechanics of bodies, um, and also the one I'll be showing a little bit later is uh, Mocha, which is a free app where you can view and plot data. So, uh, oh yeah, one other thing I would mention is that for uh, both the C3D and CSV formats, uh, you can basically get all of the kitchen sink uh, channels for, from all of the body segments, um, which you, is quite useful. There's a lot of data you won't want to use, but it's nice to have it all there in one place. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about next, which is the data channels. Um, these are available also um, not only in the export formats, but also in the um, SDK access. So um, first is time, it's uh, measured in seconds. This is, that's um, pretty clear. Uh, and then this uh, slide shows the different rotation uh, data formats that come out of the data stream. There are three different uh, quaternion formats. There's, a, there's also another one that I didn't mention here, it's called body quaternion, but the main ones, so there's global quaternion, uh, then there's local quaternion, um, and then there's the delta quaternion. And uh, I'll talk more about what these mean later and kind of show what the um, coordinate frames are for each one of them. Uh, next is the um, R channel, which is the local space Euler angle rotations and radians. Um, and I'll also be talking a bit more about that in a, in a bit. That one's uh, the one we'll be using to plot data later, um, but there are many reasons you might choose to use quaternions over Euler angles. Um, so next, uh, let's see, LA is a useful channel. It's global linear acceleration uh, specified in, in Gs. Uh, that's it's an estimate because, you know, the rotation is based on the current rotation of the sensor, um, but it, it can be very useful if you want to look at um, the acceleration of a body segment. Um, the same for velocity. Um, it's LV is the channel that specifies in centimeters per second. Um, then there's LT, which is the global linear translation, also specified in centimeters. And C, which is a uh, very similar to LT, 
um, but it also includes a positional constraint in the W channel. Uh, next, you have the calibrated sensor data. So there's the calibrated accelerometer measured in G, that's the A channel. M channel is the uh, magnetometer, which is in microtesla. And then G, which is the gyroscope measurement um, specified in degrees per second. And move on to um, the P is the pressure channel. Um, this one is only, it only exists in the left foot and right foot node, but this one's uh, pretty useful. It's, it's the um, data in the W and the X channel. It specifies the heel and the toe uh, pressure data directly from the insole pressure sensor. And finally, EM, which is the air magnitude, and um, which can be useful. It specifies if there, you know, if, if the magnitude is high, um, it indicates there there might be some air. Uh, sources of air are usually um, due to either magnetic interference, but uh, it can be due to other factors. All right, rotational format. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's available in quaternion and Euler angle. Uh, in general, quaternions are preferred over Euler angles. Uh, number one, they're continuous. Um, Euler angles can have sing singularities, uh, such as gimbal lock. And uh, second, Euler angles are usually, actually, I would say sometimes constrained to um, 0 to 360 degrees or minus 180 to 180. Uh, many different softwares will clip the data and so it can't go beyond and then it will wrap around to Say it goes from zero to two pi, and then it goes back to zero when it should actually be increasing, uh, and that can cause some problems if you're trying to use the data um, for some type of signal processing. Okay, so let's move on to the coordinate frames uh, for the various um, quaternion data that is output: the global GQ, um, local LQ, and the body BQ. Uh, I didn't mention body before, but it's actually probably have more useful in a lot of ways than the global quaternion. So first, uh, global quaternion, um, it's based on the coordinate frame of uh, shown on the right. Um, Z, positive Z axis is west, Y is up, and X is south. And all of these coordinate systems are right-handed uh, systems. So that global quaternion that comes out for each one of the sensors is going to be relative to the sensor itself. Uh, and so, it, as you can imagine, that it's, if the sensor moves around on the body segment, it's not necessarily going to be as useful as the other one, which is the body quaternion uh, format, which I'll show in a minute. But uh, local quaternion is, also, is very useful and probably, in some cases, probably the most useful. Uh, this is the, the same as the output from the R channel, which is an Euler angle. So it gives the um, rotation of the joint or the body segment um, relative to the local coordinate frame. So it's in the frame of the parent joint or body segment. And LQ is going to be zero uh, when it's in the authored rest pose, which you can see is the standard T pose on the right. Uh, last, the body quaternion, which I mentioned. Um, this one is interesting. It's, it's the, so it's the body segment or joint rotation uh, relative to the global coordinate frame. Um, the difference is that BQ is relative to the body segment, whereas GQ is relative to the sensor node. So um, BQ takes into account the rest pose, um, which basically gets kind of an offset of the where the sensor is located relative to where um, the authored uh, system thinks that it's located or where it's supposed to be located. Um, and that allows you to get um, a, is basically you get, you get a quaternion in the, in, in the global frame, in the global coordinate frame, uh, what's, you know, north, south, east, west, up, down, um, but it's of the body segment and not of the sensor, um, if that makes sense. If you look at the data stream, it would make uh, more sense. And we, I won't be going over the body quaternion more, but um, it's definitely a recommended channel to look at. All right, so now mentioning the SDK, um, this is probably one of the best uh, features I think of our Shadow product in general is that we provide a very um, in-depth SDK that lets you get very easy access to all the different uh, data from the data stream. Um, it's available in most of the popular uh, languages, C++, Python, Java, C Sharp, JavaScript. Um, and it also supports um, most of the three uh, types of software um, 
not also you know like MATLAB, Octave, um, R Studio, uh, pretty much any kind of tool, uh, we make it very easy to load um, our shadow data into it, and then you know you can get going on your data processing, whatever that may be. Okay, so let's move on. And uh, this section of the presentation, um, uh, we're going to go over recording a mocap take. And the goal here was to take two different mocap takes, um, one of a normal walk cycle uh, with normal gait, and then one of an abnormal uh, walk cycle with a uh, gait that's uh, we're kind of simulating limping. Um, I have already recorded this. Like I said, I, I took the suit out to a park earlier and um, recorded Two different takes and uh, you can see them here. I'm just going to jump out to the video so you can take a look. Okay, so next let's go back and we're going to actually load the mocap take into Mocha um, so that we can then go into the uh, data and look for some segments of gate cycle frame ranges that we want to uh, look into further inside of the other tools, which I'll show you later in MATLAB and also in Python. So first we open up Mocha and, uh, and we are going to open up the take one C3D that uh, we exported from the take that we recorded. And you can see normally when you load it, um, you're not going to have any kind of uh, body segments rendered, but you can go up and select the uh, shadow. This is in the, you know, the previous um, tutorial we just looked at. And then you'll see all the connecting um, body segment lines. So uh, click play and then you can see we're going to, that's where I start the take. Walking, turning around. That's uh, pretty apparent. That looks about right. Um, there is a slight um, incline that I walked up and down because uh, it was outdoors. Um, Would have been better to do it on flat surface, but uh, looks like we got some good data anyway. So let's look for a good. Uh, let's maybe go toward the walk back and. Look for a like a, a cycle of a, a gate where the left foot hits the ground, and then right foot, and then left foot. So we get the full cycle. So let's just choose this one. Um, I believe looks kind of like you know it's not going to be exact, but around 800 starting frame to maybe about 920. Let's say 926 for the end frame. And then starting from this, that can be our next uh, cycle, uh, 926 to left foot, right foot, left foot. Let's see, left foot where it hits the ground, maybe about, um, let's just say 1042. That's about right. So let's remember those numbers. I wrote them down here, and we'll be using those in both the MATLAB and Python scripts to load up those specific cycles. Um, next, let's load the second take, which is the um, the one with the simulated limping or the abnormal gait cycle. Let's see. So from the camera's perspective, this would be about how it looked, and you can see yeah, it's a pretty good representation of uh, the take, where the the left leg is being uh, dragged behind slightly. So for this one, let's go back and again, maybe just select one that's kind of on the way back towards the computer. Um, so from the left foot hitting the ground, uh, well, it's, yeah, so now the left foot hasn't, the right foot's on the ground. Here's where the left foot strikes, it's right around. Uh, let's say right around here, 1196. And then see right foot, it's the ground. Left foot is kind of dragging behind. Going to 1357 or so. Okay, so that's 1357. And then 
we'll move on see what the next uh, goes the right foot on the ground and then the left foot drags slightly and then the left foot on the ground at say 1522 so now that we have those uh, keyframes, um, which are essentially it's uh, in, in seconds, you just divide by 100 uh, because this is at 100 frames per second. But we'll use those indexes um, to load the data in MATLAB and in Python. OK, so um, now that we've done the uh, frame range selection inside of Mocha, uh, let's now next load the data into MATLAB. Um, in this case, I'm actually using Octave, uh, our scripts that we provide for um, the file IO and loading into um, MATLAB also work uh, well with Octave. Um, so first, um, let's go out and I can uh, quick show the where you can grab some of the um, necessary tools. Uh, so our uh, GitHub repo selection uh, is under motion-workshop and you can get all the different um, tools here for loading data um, as well as the SDK download. Um, for the loading into MATLAB you'll need a, a module called uh, shadow-file-io-matlab and you can just download it from this repo here. Um, it gives there's some information about you know how to use it and um, but in this case we'll just kind of be walking through step by step. So here I've opened up Octave, and uh, before we get started in here, um, I'll just go to, over to my um, text editor window so we can uh, talk about what we're gonna be doing inside of Octave, uh, and or MATLAB, if that's the tool that you have. Um, I've made four different scripts, uh, which I'll go over to show how they function and the type of uh, commands that are used, but um, all these are going to use the um, MATLAB file IO uh, module that is, uh, I mentioned just a bit ago on um, available from our GitHub repo to uh, load the take data and then we're going to take certain ranges of data from different uh, body segments um, and compare them. So the, let's, the first one we're going to do is uh, just take the normal gate um, that we just recorded um, and look at the entire um, signal of that uh, for um, just one of the body segments. We're going to look at the, the left leg, which is the actual the left knee, and also the pressure channels from the left foot. So as you can see here, it's uh, the function is uh, plot all normal gait. And the first line is uh, we're running from the shadow uh, file IO uh, module it's a command called take read. And what this will do is you just you specify the um, uh, M stream file of the take you want to load, and it will load it into um, the data matrix as well as um, you'll get a header from that uh, take. So we did that, we loaded it, um, and next we're going to load what's called the shadow node key command. Uh, what this is, it's a it's a separate file um, which uh, basically it's it's generated um, uh, such that you'll get a an ID mapping or a key for each one of the different body segments. So you can just reference it by name. It's uh, more of a convenience for, for mapping uh, the body segments. So um, we get the, the name and the name from the header will be all the different data channels. Um, and you can see down here, we're going to eventually be reading R and P, which is the Euler angle rotation and pressure sensor. So um, the first step that we need to do is to um, use the range commands to get the range of columns for the specific body segment and the specific data channel we want to look at. So for this, we want for our range, we're going to get call the range commands and get the left leg body segments um, range of columns for the R channel. And just make sure that we actually have a range here. And uh, next, and do the same thing for the pressure chain, pressure channel, on the left foot. So with those two, we have the range of columns um, that we'll need to index into the um, the data, which is located in A. Uh, but first, let's get the total number of frames. So we look at the um, the size of A, and we get um, basically the size of um, the number of samples in one row. Next, um, we're going to uh, actually get the R data. Um, so that's the rotation channel is going to be extracted from our uh, A matrix, and we're going to take 
um, basically we want every single row and we only want the columns that are specified in our range. So once we have this, we're going to have, um, you know, basically just uh, three columns, which are going to be X, Y, and Z uh, rotation channels of the Euler ang angle data. Same thing for P data. Um, we'll index into it using P range, which is the pressure channel of the left foot. Uh, but for the left foot, we only want the first two channels, the W and X channels, which will be the heel and the toe pressure data. Uh, next, we're going to just create a time axis, uh, which will um, be able, so we're going to be able to plot the data. Um, header.h is going to be the time step, which is um, 10 milliseconds, 100 frames per second. Once we do that, um, we'll create some figures and plot the data. This will be slightly different in MATLAB. Octave has a funny plotting system. But uh, essentially what we're doing is we're taking um, the x channel, which is the time uh, axis, and then we're plotting the r data, um, which will be rx, ry, and rz, and then creating another subplot down here, which will plot p data. Um, and uh, this time isn't correct. It should be uh, count since it's the pressure data. But let's, um, let's actually just run the script now and uh, see what it looks like. So it's uh, plot all normal gate. OK, so here we get the data that came out. And as you can see, it looks very similar to um, the rotation data we just looked at inside of um, our previous uh, Mocha tool that we loaded the data in as well. Up here, we have the rotation. Down here, we have the, the pressure channel. And um, you can see it, it lines up pretty nicely, um, which it, it shows this exact same data we were just looking at in Mocha. OK, so um, then let's look at the abnormal gate. Um, which was the second take we just uh, did where I was kind of simulating a limp. Uh, so it's, it's, the, it's the exact same uh, as uh, normal gait, except that here we're loading the second take. So same data, um, it's, it's going to have a different number of frames, um, but we're going to load it and then show the exact same data as we did last time. Let me just change the name to abnormal. So let's do the, run the same thing. Plot all abnormal gate. And here we are. You can see already you can kind of tell that the um, the cadence of the walk is, is different from the previous one. The uh, pressure data looks similar. Um, and it's, you can't really tell too much from, from this sort of uh, comparison. So <clears throat> what we should do next, I think, is uh, load up um, uh, some of the cycles that we got the uh, start and end frames for from within uh, Mocha. So the first one, let's do, let's look at the plot cycle normal gate, uh, which is going to load the first, the normal gate cycle. And we load the take data the same way, um, load the key. Everything is the same down to um, this area down here where we, we get the pressure data. Um, and then we actually have a, uh, the time range for the gate cycle that we marked down in Mocha. So the first one started at um, frame 800. And the second one started at frame uh, 926. So each one of them is about 120 or so frames long, 126 frames. Let's just say the duration is 126. So then we create um, a time channel of the duration we want to plot. And then what we're going to do is um, select the, um, we want to select, so we want to take the data, um, which is going to be, we've already created the, um, uh, the R data and the P data. Uh, uh, vectors that we're going to be using for um, plotting, which is essentially the three columns and all the rows for each frame. Uh, what we, we want to do now is to select um, only the frames that we want. So on from the from the uh, time channel, we want to go from start one frame to start one plus the duration, and then we want to select all of the rows, and do the same thing for uh, the second, uh, which will be start two, and start two plus duration. So then we're going to um, have two different uh, time segments that we can look at and plot. So we do the same for the um, pressure data from the uh, P data. Then we select the same frame ranges. And then uh, in order to make it a little bit more interesting, uh, I've just um, uh, appended the pressure uh, channels onto the um, rotation channel so we can plot them in the same graph. 
So once we have that, we've, we basically have the um, normal gate one and normal gate two, and we'll just plot these two uh, combined um, data of, of rotation and pressure and uh, see what it looks like. So this is plot cycle normal gate. Okay. Yeah, so that's um, interesting to see. So we can see this is just the segment of the one um, rotation. You can see that the rotation of the, the knee goes up and about um, mid gate, it's about maybe 65 or 70 degrees rotation. It goes back down, then it cycles back. And then it does the same again over here. And as you can see in, in, the, in the purple, uh, this is the pressure channel of the left foot. So as the left foot pressure drops off, the knee starts rotating, and then later the um, this legend is kind of blocking it, but the pressure will st st come back up as the left foot hits the ground again. And it looks like it's about the same for both of these, um, which is normal if it's the, the same gait that I was performing. So uh, to make speed things up a bit, um, I did the exact same thing for the abnormal gait, and that, that script is um, has minimal change. It's just reading from the second take instead of the first. And then we plot that data, um, and we can take a look at it. So you can notice right away that the it looks a little bit different, like the uh, number one, the rotation maximum for the knee is only going up to like maybe 50, 55 or 60 degrees, um, uh, much less than the um, normal gait. And it looks like it, from when the foot hits the ground in this, ro in this range here with the pressure data, um, it takes longer for the knee to rotate uh, compared to the other take, which we can compare. Um, so this is the normal gait, and here's the abnormal gait. And, um, you know, that's it. Off the top of my head, that does look like the two main changes that I see. You could probably do more if you plotted, uh, for instance, like the uh, both the left and the right knee rotation um, to see if they're symmetrical. Um, but I won't do that here. This is just, uh, that's what I'll show for this portion of loading the data in MATLAB. Okay, and now that we've finished that with MATLAB, let's uh, move on and do a, kind of a similar take loading uh, process inside of Python. Uh, so we can plot some of the data from our chosen gate cycle, and then we can um, use NumPy and matplotlib to uh, plot the data in a similar fashion as we did in MATLAB. All right, so for the next portion of the presentation, um, I'm going to show how to load uh, data into Python and then um, plot it and you know, look at the various different channels, similar to what we just did in MATLAB slash Octave. Uh, so first, we will need to go to the GitHub repository again, and this time we would go and get the shadow file IO Python module. This is what we'll be using to, it makes uh, loading take data very easy, uh, and it also allows you to pretty easily um, parse out different data uh, from the different body segments and uh, data channels that you want to look at. So I've already done this and grabbed it, but you just install uh, the module, um, and then once you have that, uh, we can go and look at the various different um, ways that we can use that module in Python. And uh, so similar to in MATLAB, I've made four different scripts that do um, kind of the, sim the same thing as we just did in, Ma in MATLAB and Octave. Uh, first of all, we'll just um, plot the entirety of the normal and abnormal gate pattern, and then we'll look at the uh, different cycles that we marked down for the uh, frame ranges from inside of Mocha. But first of all, importing uh, the modules, uh, you'll import the shadow.file.io. Um, I'm also using uh, NumPy and matplotlib, and as well as Cycler, which is basically just for um, specifying different uh, colors and uh, rendering for the plotting in matplotlib. Uh, the beginning is the same as before. Um, we just specify a path. Uh, if you don't want to specify a path and you just want to load the newest take, you can actually use um, shadow file IO find newest take, and that will grab it directly for you if you're parsing a lot of data. Um, then we're going to um, open up that um, data.m stream uh, from, from this uh, path, which is the first take of the normal gate. And then we're going to use the read stream uh, method from inside of the file IO module. 
That's going to report back um, uh, a few different pieces of data. It'll uh, give us info, node list, and data. And uh, we'll go over those in a second. So next, we want to um, use the same. Uh, well, we're going to open up the mtake file, which is it has some metadata for the um, for the actual take. The stream mstream file has the binary data. mtake has the uh, data that describes that take. And so from that um, mtake file that we load, uh, we'll use the file IO's um, make node map function. And uh, what that's going to do is take the node list and also um, the mtake file, and it's going to give us a node map, which will allow us to index um, based off of um, the both the body segment name and also the channel name. Next, um, let's get the number of frames uh, from the info uh, data that we got back uh, from up here in the um, read stream. And then also we'll get the stride, um, which is just you know how uh, many um, uh, floating point data um, pieces there are that we need to skip over to get to the next row of data. Next, we're going to need to um, reshape the data. So uh, we need to basically make it so that we have, uh, instead of having just one row of data, uh, we want to have um, all the channels are going to, one row will specify um, basically one frame. So we're taking the number of frames in the stride and reshaping the data into a new um, a new matrix of data that we'll index into. So uh, let's go. Let's see. For the next next portion, we're going to want to get um, first of all. We'll let, we need to get the column indexes for uh, the um, R channel for the left leg. And you can see we indexed into that. This gives us um, a tuple of um, start and end column indexes which we then go into say we want all the rows and we just want the, the begin and, and end column indexes uh, from the, ma the big data array, um, sorry, data matrix. And from that, we'll get data R, which will just have the rotation channel um, such that each row is a frame. Convert it to degrees because it's in radians. Um, then we do the same thing for the left foot pressure channel. Um, in this one, we only want the first two columns. It's actually four, four columns of data, but the first two are the only ones we'll use, W and X, which is the heel and toe pressure. And then I added a little offset here because um, it's, uh, the, it actually has negative values, and we want it to go from 0 to 4. All right, so next we create the time axis. Um, basically, just like we did in MATLAB, we get the time step, and we create um, the number of frames, make an A range from NumPy. Uh, this is all about rendering um, the graphs, the plotting, and giving like RGB um, teal and indigo for the um, telling what colors to make the plots. And then next, uh, we're going to make two subplots. Uh, this is just the same as we did in MATLAB, where the first one will be the um, uh, normal gait of the left knee, and then the second plot will be uh, the pressure of the left foot. And all of this will the, um, you know, it's plotted for the entirety of the range of the entire take. So let's go and run that. Um, and it says uh, Python plot all normal gate.py. And so here are the results. Where we'll get, it looks like very similar as it should, just like in MATLAB. I actually kind of like the, um, the rendering of, you know, matplotlib. It's quite nice. It's a very, um, it's free. It works really well. Down here we have the pressure data. Um, yeah, so that's that. So um, I made a, another uh, script which is exactly the same, but it loads the um, abnormal gate data. And let's just plot that. Yeah, so it looks the same kind of as in did in MATLAB. Um, one of the things we can do is just plot them both and put the normal over here and then put the abnormal over here. And you can see just comparing like this, the rotation is 60, 70 degrees for the normal and down it's only, you know, between 35 and maybe 55 degrees uh, for the abnormal gate. Okay, so moving on, um, let's next go to look at the, uh, s the gate cycles that um, and plot those like we did in MATLAB. So it begins the same in the script. Um, the, the difference is once we get down, just like we did in MATLAB, uh, we 
have the start uh, frames for each one of the two cycles we want to look at. These are the normal gate cycle one and two starting at 8926 frames. And then down here we do the same where we create uh, two different um, selections from the, the, the full uh, rotational data where we want to just index from the um, start frame and then to start plus duration. So we do that for the two um, rotational uh, gate cycle index uh, start frames, same for the pressure. And then I did the same thing where we concatenate the rotation and pressure data so we can plot them all in one. And then down here we just plot them for both of them and uh, it's uh, gonna be pretty apparent once we run that. Um, so this is, let's see, plot cycle normal gate. Okay. Yeah, so here we have a very similar output as what we saw in MATLAB, where you have, um, I believe I misspoke earlier when I said this is where the foot steps down. This is the, actually the left foot pressure high. It's stepped here, and then as it goes low, the left foot is lifting, and then the left knee rotates as the knee, the foot is lifted off the ground. And then the pressure goes back up, and you know the left foot is on the ground again. And it's uh, very similar for the second um, gate that happens right after that. So let's leave that open and then run the plot uh, cycle abnormal. And we'll see that in this one, it's also similar to the output in MATLAB. You can see um, uh, basically the same, same exact data as we plotted in MATLAB, or it's doing it in Python. And uh, we can take the two and compare them. So we have the normal gate and then the abnormal gate. And these, I had it so that the, um, the um, frame range, sorry, the value range in the y-axis is the same. So you can see that, you know, you can compare magnitudes between the two. I find it easier to do this than to have four subplots, but it, there are many different ways to do it, of course. Um, but yeah, that's a, kind of an overview of how you load data uh, using our uh, file.io module for Shadow into um, Python. All right, well, thanks a lot for watching. Um, I, I am sorry I couldn't have been there in person for the conference and the workshop, but I, I hope this presentation has given you a bit more information about how you can use our tools to load data um, from Shadow into various applications and um, kind of look at that data in different ways. Uh, if any of you have any questions, uh, please get in touch. Um, again, my name is Eric, and uh, my email is eric at motionshadow.com. All right, thanks.